the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. It is a blessing for me to be with you at the beginning of a new year. In every, in every occasion, when I begin to think of what message I want to relate to the people, most of the time I don't do that until close to the time. And uh, well, I have because I keep thinking about it a lot, but it does not solidify until very close to the end. But this year, New Year's Eve, I thought of the word new. And this is what I spoke about in the uh, St. Mark's Church in Cedar Grove. And the question that came to my mind what is new about the year? We always say Happy New Year. How is it new and what's new about it? So this is the question that I was thinking about in the beginning of the year. And from that question, I began to think about the covenant which God has established with us, which we call the new covenant, right? So really what, what I want to share with you is what do we mean by the new covenant? And we will try to relate this to, the, since we are in the beginning of the year, how can we make this year really a new year, a new, it's a new year in every understanding, in every aspect. Because if we understand that God has come, He took our humanity to establish with us a new covenant, therefore our life must become a new life. It's meaningless if God establishes with us a new covenant and our life does not change. We just live the same way we, always, we have always lived. Um, do you have Bibles to help me read? Okay, since you have already a Bible, can you please read Hebrews 8, 7 to 13? Be their God. 
basically St. Paul is saying that God is establishing a new covenant with us this was prophecy by the way he was quoting a prophecy from Jeremiah what you just read most of what you read was a prophecy from Jeremiah so God is making a covenant a new covenant with new people he said I will be their God and there will be they will be my people right because the Israelites thought of themselves as being God's people in the Old Testament they thought that God chose them and they are God's people but now God is establishing a new covenant with new people and he's saying that they will become or they will be my people and I will be their God see so if you want to think of Christianity in a different way what is Christianity Christianity is the new covenant it is the new covenant which God has established with his new Israel with his new people because God had established many covenants in the Old Testament that didn't work out and I'll tell you why but now he is establishing a new covenant but it's not just a new covenant but it's the last covenant this is it there are no more covenants this is the last one that God is going to establish with mankind because next thing he will come to judge the world it will be the end so this is really the last covenant because this last covenant he established by his only begotten son as we will see again you see so um, it is a very unique covenant and the door has been opened not only for one nation which is uh, the Jewish nation but it's for, for all nations as the Lord said in Matthew chapter 28 go and baptize all nations okay and or go and preach to all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit why is God trying to make covenants because after sin God wanted to save mankind and of course it doesn't make sense that he will only save Israel right because Israel just won 10 million 15 million and what's the population of the earth now 6 billion or something right close so it does not make any sense that God will make a covenant what's let's say 12 million let's say the number is 12 million to make it easy and the total number is 6 billion so this is one two over Let me show it out. Two, um, yeah. Hmm? Six is 12 million. Well, we're dividing by 6 million now. So it's 2 over 1,000, right? Did you get this calculation? Because a billion is 1,000. Huh? Point two percent, right? Point point two point two percent, right? So it doesn't make sense that God will establish His covenant with point two percent, and He will leave out ninety eight point eight percent of 
the population. But why did God cho cho choose Israel? Basically, as St. Paul says, because of the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they were faithful. They were, Abraham was the only one faithful to God at one point. No? Amelie two divided by one thousand. What is it? Hmm? Huh? Point two percent. Yeah, okay. So I know my mathematics. <laughs> so now God established his covenant with what was who can tell me what was the first covenant ever huh? for Abraham hmm? yes but this is not a covenant this is just a, a blessing from God because, by the way let's define what the covenant Saying what? Huh? Well, it started with a promise by God. God gave a promise. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we call it the first messianic promise. Okay? The first messianic promise. Who can read this for me? Since Abuna said that we were recording, so whoever reads will come to read in the uh, microphone so that it can be heard in the recording. The first messianic promise that through the seeds of woman, the Savior will come. Uh, Genesis 3.15, this is easy, just open the first few pages. Can you read? And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So we call this the first messianic promise. But then the first covenant was the covenant God established with our father Noah. Okay? And what was the sign of the covenant? The rainbow, right? So it started with just a promise in Genesis 3.15 and then it became promise with a sign in nature, which is the rainbow. And what was the promise that God made at that time? He will never destroy the earth again, right? It will never happen again. It hasn't happened only once at that time. <clears throat> and then after our father Noah, God established many covenants with our father Abraham. But what was the most important one? Hmm? Yes, but what was the fir the, 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 the like the, the first or not first the, the most important covenant that God made with our father Abraham that lasted for many years? Hmm? Yeah, this is one of them that the ch his, his children will be like the, as many as the stars and the sand. But the sure the, the savior will come from his seeds, but. The, it's, it's, it's the what? The circumcision. Okay? It's the circumcision. Can we read it in... Uh, where is it? Let's see. On the eighth day, the child should be circumcised.
It's uh, Genesis 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you. And will multiply you exceedingly. Then Ab Abraham fell on his faith and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. And I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations out of you and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And I will give you to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger and the land of Canaan as an everlasting possession and I will be their God. Okay? And then, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant and your descendants after you throughout their generations. So you see, they have to keep the covenant. So it's not like, okay, I will establish my covenant with you and you have to do nothing, right? So they have to keep their side of the covenant, you see? Then this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. So now we begin to see that God has established his covenant with a sign in the body. Okay? Which is circumcision. On the eighth day, and who can tell me what's the significance of the number eight? Anyone knows? The number eight represents a new beginning because like if a week is one week, uh, seven days, so one week is seven days, then the eighth day is a new week. It's a new beginning, right? It's all the whole idea of being new, right? So God said on the eighth day, a child will be circumcised representing this new covenant or new life. And then God also established his covenant with Moses, the prophet, after they came out of Egypt. This is the one that St. Paul was referring to. He said, I will establish, in the um, Hebrews passage we read, I will establish with you a new covenant, not like the covenant I established with them when they came out of Egypt. Right? So it's a, it's a new covenant. It's of course a better covenant than that covenant. So what's the idea? The idea is, as we agreed, that God chose the Israelites because of the fathers. They were faithful. They walked in his way. In order that he will give them the laws and to prepare humanity for his coming through the prophets, uh, pro prophets and the prophecies which he will send, so that he, humanity will be ready when he comes to receive him. But of course, it doesn't make sense that God will confine himself for only 0.2% of all humans and not the 98.8%. But now we understand that when Christ came, and when we read the Gospel of St. Matthew, when he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, so baptism now is the sign of the new covenant, right? You see, if we say in the Old Testament it was the circumcision, now it is the baptism through which we enter into that new covenant with Christ, right? Do you understand this? We, we all know that, what's baptism? It's, it's not just that it's for the forgiveness of our sins and through it we become children of God and we become part of God's people and we become joined to his mystical body, etc., etc. So, God is establishing a new covenant with us. This is my point.
And because the people in the Old Testament, the Israelites, they never kept their side of the promise, then, as St. Paul just said, By saying it is a new covenant, he makes the old one a hmm, annulled, right? Or what, what's the word he used here? Obsolete. Yeah. No effect. Has no effect. Why? That's why when, when Pope Shenouda visited the United States, then uh, Carter at that time was the president. Then he asked His Holiness, did you talk against the Israelites that they are not God's people? He said, if they are God's people, then you and me, we are not God's people, right? If they are God's people, then we are not God's, part of God's people. Uh, and then he explained to him that there was a covenant, but they never kept the covenant. The covenant had conditions that they had to keep. If they didn't keep it, then there's no covenant anymore. So you see, they were God's people for the reasons I just mentioned in the Old Testament, but now in the New Testament, or the New Covenant, the door has been opened for all nations, and we say all nations, this includes who? Huh? The Jewish nation, right? So they are not excluded. They are included. So when the Lord said, go and make disciples out of all nations, this includes the Jews if they decide to come to enter the faith. Right? So they are not excluded. But they are not the only people of God. In the Jewish understanding, um, their division of human beings, so you're either a Jew or a Gentile, or a Jew or Greek. The Greek classification, you know what it is? So you're either Greek or barbarian. Because Greeks believe in philosophy, so they are very educated. And if you're not educated, then you're a barbarian. Anyway, so... Um, so our Lord Jesus Christ came to establish his new covenant with us with humanity and when he presented his body and blood on the night of his crucifixion he said about the, the, the cup he took the cup and he said Drink it, all of you, for this is huh? the new, my new covenant. It is the cup in the new covenant or in my blood. So we begin to, to see the covenantial language here. That God is establishing this new covenant between us and him. So there's the question now. If there is a new covenant, what are, who's a lawyer here? Do you have a lawyer that can give me a terminology? What do you call the items of, of the agreement? Like, huh? terms and conditions. What are the terms and con conditions? We said God has to do certain things and we have to do certain things. So what are the terms and con conditions? Because now if you are a Christian, you have to understand that when, it, when they were baptized, they had to make that vow, that contract, or that agreement, or that covenant with God because, before they were baptized. Right? And that's why the fathers, and you read the fathers, they say, didn't you give, didn't you face the, the West and renounce Satan and then you renounce the world and then you look towards the East and accepted Christ. This is what we see in the baptismal right now. What are the fathers saying? They are saying, you made a vow. You have an agreement. There is a con contract with, you know, a covenant between you and God. Why do you break it now? Why do you turn back to the world? 
after you have given your back to the world, right? So when we look to the world, I renounce you, Satan, or etc. And then I accept you, Jesus. So the fathers are saying, why do you turn back and look towards the West after you have given your back to the world? This is the point. So let me summarize what I want to tell you in the following points. God has already done for us four things. And he's faithful and he will never change his four because he's faithful, right? He will never break any of his promises, right? And we have to keep four things as well. Easy? Easy. I'm going to write them for you. But I want you to understand them today so that when you leave, begin to think. Do I understand my covenant with God? Or God's covenant which he has established with me? And do I agree with it? Am I keeping it? If I keep it, then I deserve the blessings that come with it. If I don't keep it, too bad. Okay? Ready? Ready. Ready? Ready? Number one, here I'm going to write God. Us, humans. So the first thing that God has done is a hmm? I heard something that I, that I want to say, but I just want to. Very good, very good. Ben Alex Shatter. Shaklak kada Shatter, yeah. He himself established that covenant through what? His own? Huh? His own blood. He himself established that covenant. It's not like, okay, I'll do it through Abraham, or I'll do it through Moses, or I'll do it through Noah, or others. This covenant is through the Son of God Himself. And it's not a sign like the others outside of Himself, but it is His own blood. He did it with His own blood. Okay? So, I want someone to read for me Hebrews 12, 24. Quickly. Hmm. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. Okay, and while you're here, so, yeah, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. He is the mediator of the new covenant. Read also for me 9, 11 to 14. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. Now with the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once Not for all the blood of goats and calves but with his own blood he entered into the most holy place hmm. having obtained eternal redemption for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God thank you so he is the mediator of the new covenant through his blood, which is far more better than the blood of goats and calves, right? And if this is what the blood of goats and calves have achieved, guess how much more the blood of the Son of God will do, right? So 
I'm going to go fast because we have limited time. So finish number one. Do you want me to write the references for you? Or you're okay? Huh? You're okay? Okay. So now this is the first point. He established this covenant by himself through his blood. Number two. The first covenant So the, the first point is it's not someone else but it's Christ himself the son of God himself. The first covenant the the, the old covenant did not heal us. Did not give us healing. What was the problem? The problem was death, sin, sin, death, and corruption, right? That's what St. Athanasius has explained in the Incarnatione, on the Incarnation, right? What did he say? Had it been only a problem of sin, maybe the, the, the solution would have been easier. But now there's a problem of corruption as a consequence of sin. Okay, so God cannot just say, okay, I forgive you. This is corruption of our nature. The Old Testament or the Old Covenant did not heal us from our sin. But we are healed through Jesus, through the mediator of the last covenant or the second covenant or the new covenant. Okay? You see? Abuna was a pharmacist, right? Do we have more pharmacists here? Our Pope now is a was a pharmacist. Sometimes when they don't know the disease, but you have high fever. The high fever is dangerous for you. So they just give you something to lower the fever, just to control. But it did not heal the reason for, for the fever, right? It did not get to the root of the problem. This is what the Old Testament did. Didn't heal. It was just something in which we looked as if in the mirror that said, you are a sinner. Okay, I know I am a sinner, but what are you going to do to heal me? I know I am a sinner. Okay. St. Paul said, this is what the, that's all the law did. So if you look in the mirror and say, I'm sick. Okay, thank you so much. What about healing? What about the medicine? No, I can't help you. So what about the, the New Testament or the New Covenant? It heals us. That's why St. Ignatius of Antioch, he said that the Holy Eucharist is the medicine of immortality. The medicine of immortality the antidote of sin because the poison of the serpent that bit us and made us sin now we take the medicine of immortality the antidote so that we will not die which is the Holy Eucharist this is what Saint uh, Ignatius of Antioch said. Arfin lama bin ulwa abra na min sumil haya. Filahna, shamam sabil abra na min sumil haya. What does this mean? He healed us from the poison of the serpent. Who can read for me Isaiah 53 5? And by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. Malachi. The book of Malachi says the son of righteousness will appear and healing in his wings. When it says his wings, what does this mean? The wings, when Christ went up on the cross, then spread out his hands like wings and the healings came up through the cross. Therefore,
through the second covenant we are healed perfectly healed so any forgiveness of sins in the old covenant or even in the new covenant before Christ was crucified was only a promise that the sins will be forgiven okay who can read Hebrews 8 12 we just read it from the prophecy of Jeremiah but we'll just read it again since you read it can you please read it once more one more time just uh, just read this uh, Hebrews 8 for I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more So you can begin to think of the blessings of the new covenant. Their lawless deeds and their sins I will remember no more. Can you believe that? Total healing. It's not there anymore. Imagine someone who has cancer and then these doctors say the cancer has spread all over the body you can't do anything about it okay this was our condition in the new in the, the old testament or in the old covenant and then christ comes and says i can heal you how by my blood take the holy communion and we are healed perfectly healed they check us, we are perfectly healed, nothing. This is exactly this, you know, our sin is more dangerous than cancer. Cancer can kill the body, but sin can kill the spirit, right? So we are totally healed through the new covenant. The third point is that what God has done and he established his new covenant, his law, not outside of us, but inside of us. So it's inside. Again, we read this. Um, we read it in the beginning, but... So he says in Hebrews 8, 10, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they will be my people. So where is the law? It's inside my heart, inside, inside my mind. The problem with the old covenant is that this was only from the outside. They have practices from the outside, but nothing changes from the inside, right? That's why I read Matthew 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why? You cleanse the outside. It's so all actions from the outside. But what about the inside? Still full of corruption. But Christ came and he said, I want to heal you from inside. And the inside will show on the outside. Not only we do things superficially from the outside, but the inside is the same. That's why it's very important in Christianity to understand that our practices should not only be from the outside. Anything that we do should come from within. Okay? Because God's law is inside us. Saint Serapion, one of the saints of the church, he had a garment and he had a Bible. One time he went to buy something. And then he saw a poor man freezing to death. Then he took off his garment and covered him with it. 
And then he saw another person who had a debt. So he sold his Bible and paid the debt. Do you know, at that time, Bibles were very expensive because it was all handwritten, right? When he returned, his disciple met with him and he said, Where is your garment? He said, I sent it before me where I can find it. See? Look at the answer. I sent it before me where I can find it. Because every good action we do here is preserved for us in heaven. Then he said to him, What about the Bible from which you used to read to us and comfort us? He said to him, Every time I read it, it says to me, Sell all what you have and give to the poor. So I sold it. What is he saying? He's saying, I sold it because now I am practicing the Bible, not reading the Bible. I am practicing. I become the living Bible because his laws are written in my heart and people can read the Bible in my life. They can look at me and say, and read the Bible, they read the commandments because I practice the commandments, not I preach the commandments or read the commandments. It's a big difference. That's why Christ said, you are the light of the world. See? You are the light of each one of us should reflect the light of Christ because Christ is inside me. So this is a big difference. Because when Christ is inside us, then we can shine. Reflecting his light in our life. Okay? Okay. So, now God has written his law inside us. He healed us. He established this covenant by himself. Last point. God gave us the commandment and he said but listen I will help you I will help you do it I will help you achieve it not just to give it to you and leave you alone because he said I will be with you and his name is Emmanuel, which means God is with us. And he did that by giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's why I read in His Holiness Pope Shenouda's book about the Holy Spirit that all our spiritual life depends on our fellowship with the Holy Spirit, which we the, 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 his gift we received in, in, uh, inside us. When we have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then our spiritual life will be strong. Okay. So now we finished the first four points. Again, You can imagine. Just want you to understand. God is not sending someone, but He came by Himself to establish that new covenant with us. Number two, that covenant gives us perfect healing from our sins. Number three, He wrote His law inside us. Number four, he helps us through the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so now we ask, then what is our side of this covenant? What do we have to do? The first thing we have to do is to repent.
What is repentance? Metanoia or metania, which is a change of life, total ch radical change of life. We begin to think in a different way, in a new way. We become a new person. Who can read for me 2 Corinthians 5, 17? Quickly, huh? 1 Corinthians, uh, 2 Corinthians 2, uh, 517. Mm. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. One more time. This is very important. If anyone is in Christ, huh? Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. You have to believe that. This was not written theoretically. This is true. You are a new creation. All th old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Then what can you think that is new about you? Can you think of anything new about you? Do you want me to be honest with you? Huh? Do you know what our problem is? I'm not against the baptism of babies. And the church went through that already and made the decision that because baptism is important for salvation, therefore we should baptize babies. But what, do you know what our problem is? When they were baptized in the early church, they made a conscious decision to change their life. And they knew when they accept Christianity, they will be persecuted. So it was not an advantage. Right? But they did it and they were ready to die for Christ. See? But now we grow up, we are born, our parents baptize us and we grow up in the church. But we don't make that conscious decision. And we don't make that vow. And we don't go through the teaching and understand what it means to be a true Christian. That's why we are lukewarm in our spiritual life. Lukewarm. Why? We just grew up in the church and our parents take us to church. So we go to church. That's it. But do we really have a radical change in life? Am I really walking with Christ? as I should or am I walking the same way the world wants me to walk this is our problem we no longer became the light of this world but the darkness of the world has entered in, in our lives and this is the real problem See, so everything is new in Christ if you are in Christ then everything has to change Everything has to change. That's why here in Romans 12 he says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you pre present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable to God which is your reasonable service and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world but be renewed. Or be, trans be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Do you want total healing? Do you want forgiveness? We agreed that. This is how you spell forgiveness. <clears throat> do you want forgiveness? Do you want to be healed? Christ is ready to do that. But are you ready to repent? Or are you going to say, God is so loving, God is so merciful. It's okay. He will let it pass. I can go with and sit with Abuna and confess and easy. Abuna will give me the absolution. He will not give me a hard time because Abuna is a nice Abuna. He's very kind. He will not ask me to do many things. He will just give me the absolution and I'll go back and do more sins. 
Right? This is what we do. Where is repentance? You want to be healed? Sure. I told you the cure is on the altar here every liturgy. This is the cure. But are you ready to change your life? Are you ready to repent? What else? Number two. If God has given us the gift of the Holy Spirit, then we have to have a fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So if God is ready to help us, but he's not going to help us unless we ask for help. The Lord Jesus said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father give you the Holy Spirit? So God's gifts to us, so you see what the, the verse is saying? If you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children. So he's speaking, there's a gift here or domain, right? We're speaking about gifts. If we being evil know how to give good gifts to our children, how much more will our Heavenly Father give us his gift? What is the gift? The Holy Spirit. This is what he says. How much more will your Father give you the Holy Spirit? It is God's gift to us. Do we appreciate it? Do I think of myself as being the temple of God and my body is the temple of God and the Holy Spirit abides in me? Then St. Paul says, if I make my body member of sin, then God will destroy me because I'm the temple of God. Then I have to repent and I have to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit and appreciate that gift. Right? As a Christian, I should appreciate that gift in my life and have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. God will not impose himself on us unless we choose to. Saint Augustine has said, God who created us without our will will not save us without our will. We have to be willing to be saved and to have this relationship with him through the Holy Spirit. And then he will enable us, right? So here Moses gave, gave the law but never said, I will help you or I'll enable you. But Christ is giving us the new covenant and he's saying, I'm going to help you because I'm going to give you my Holy Spirit. Okay? But we have to have fellowship through good works. As we said, just read in Romans, present your bodies as a holy and living sacrifice. This body has to sacrifice itself in worship. Which brings us to the third point. Because the law is inside us, then how can it be read by others? Okay. Through our actions, we are the light of the world. We agreed, right? But how? Who can read 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16? Hmm. Who hasn't read? 2 Corinthians 2, 14 to 16. Allah Habib. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. For we are to God the fragrance of Christ among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To the one we are the aroma of death leading to death 
and to the other the aroma of life leading to life. And who is sufficient for these things? So we are the fragrance of Christ. Okay. We are the fragrance of Christ, which means, you know what we say about the life of the saints? Their life is like a, a nice aroma. It's a nice smell. This is what their life is like. So we are the nice smelling aroma of Christ, or the nice fragrance of Christ. But we are like the incense. You know the incense? It has to be burnt to give its nice smell. You know Abuna Dawood here makes very nice incense, right? He gives it to all the priests. And Pope Shinuda insisted that the um, incense should be perfumed. It's not sometimes it's, when it's not perfumed, it just gives uh, bad smell for the chest. But when it smells nice, it gives this atmosphere in the church because this represents the lives of the people. This smell of the incense represents the life of the saints. But it can only give this nice aroma when the body is dead, when it's burned. That's why in, a, in our spiritual life we can think or, or we can talk about the mortality of the body that leads to repentance from the sins. And I want to connect this with Romans that we just read. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. Because this way, your nice smell, or the nice smell of your life, will be smelled by others. They will know Christ through your life. So being inside us, we need to live this life in Christ that can show our lovely aroma to others. Okay. I'm going to have to think of uh, how to word this in number three. But let me go to number four to end the fourth point. Every time we receive the Holy Communion, which we said, the Holy Communion, again, it's the blood of Christ through which he established his new covenant with us. Every time we drink the blood and take the Holy Communion, we have to proclaim the death of the Lord. I want someone to read 1 Corinthians 11, 25 and 26. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is, is the new covenant in my blood. This cup, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. See the wording? Think about it. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. As often as you drink, you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Does this remind you of anything? This last verse? Huh? In the liturgy, what do we say? Amen, 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 your death, O Lord, we proclaim your holy resurrection. 
and ascension into the heavens we confess and the old, all the people say that sing this right they they love this hymn but do they understand what it's, it's they're saying you know what it means it means that every time you take the holy communion it energizes you it makes you want to go out and proclaim god's death on our behalf for our salvation and you confess his resurrection to the whole world this is what it means you cannot keep this for yourself anymore you want to go out and tell people come and be saved come here and look how sweet the lord is this is what this means so this is the covenant that you cannot keep it for yourself god is saying i'm going to save you but listen i want you to tell others because this is what i came for all humanity not only for you but for everyone see this is, the, this is what we need to understand this is what we need this is how we need to live our christian life in christ this is the new covenant it's all about so it's about salvation it's about the good news it's about the new life in Christ that we must proclaim. If you feel that God has done or made a difference in your life and you like your new life in Christ, then tell others, bring others to Christ. Tell them to come and enjoy that life which you have tasted. But if you haven't tasted it, you cannot tell others about it, right? So proclaim his death. So I give the title for point number three. Because the law is inside us, then we have to die to the world and live for Christ. And Christ has said, take my yoke, carry my yoke. Because my yoke is light. See, we, we, we have to carry one kind of yoke, the yoke of the world or the yoke of Christ. The yoke of the world seems to be easy. Okay, all kinds of sins are available. Whatever you like, Satan can present it to you. Easy, right? But Satan only gives you half of the truth. He doesn't tell you the end result. He doesn't tell you that you will die. But Christ said, take my yoke upon you. Because it will give you life. He said, the road or, or the door is difficult, is, is, or the gate is narrow and the way is difficult that leads to life, right? And then the gate is very wide and the road is very easy that leads to death. You know, like what? Like the highway. The highway is a big, a huge uh, road and it's easy right but if you get into an accident it's a deadly accident that's it because you are going on a very high speed but on the side roads uh, you get into an accident it's okay not, not, a, not a big deal because you're going slowly so pick or choose the narrow gate and the difficult way that leads to life carry the yoke of Christ because it leads to life don't take the easy way out that leads to death you have to know the truth the whole truth about both ways so this summarizes before your eyes the new covenant that God has established with humanity this is what God did for us he died for us, establishing this new covenant. He healed us through his death, through his stripes. He wrote his law inside our hearts and he enabled us through giving us the gift of the Holy Spirit to do his will, to do all that. And he's telling us, he wants us to repent, to change our life, to come back to him, to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it alone. We have to have this fellowship with the Holy Spirit through the life of prayer and worship and matanias and coming to church and serving and giving our bodies as a living sacrifice. 
to die to the world, to live for Christ. It's no longer me who lives, but Christ lives in me. And not to keep this for ourselves, but to pro pro proclaim it to the whole world. Are you ready to sign the contract? Are you ready to sign the contract now? Are you ready to say, okay, Lord, now I understand what Christianity is all about and I'm ready to sign? Well, you will decline. No, God, I think it's too difficult for me. Maybe later, right now, I want to enjoy my life in the world. It's not the time yet. I'm still young and healthy. and you know, I have many things I want to do. I can't repent. It's too difficult. I can't live with you for now. Maybe later when I grow up. Who knows, right? This is the In the new year, you have to understand that Christ came to give us a new life. But the new life corresponds to a change of life. And he said, I came so that they may have a better life. It is a better life in him. Let us choose the way that leads to life. Glory be to God forever. Amen. terms of his law that is inside us this is in terms of the Holy Spirit helping us in our spiritual life this pertains to the law this pertains to the Holy Spirit because here here I will read it for you they are connected I will tell you how they are connected somehow, but not directly. This is the law itself. This is how the law is manifested, or how we can perform it. Okay? So, the law... See, there are many verses which I skipped because of I limited time. So, in the Old Testament, for example... Uh, we read the following. Exodus 13, 9. It shall be as a sign to you on your hand and as a memorial between your eyes. This is the law. That the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand the Lord has brought you out of Egypt. You shall therefore keep this uh, ordinance in its season from year to year. Okay. Now, in uh, Deuteronomy 6, it will say, You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. 
you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets be between your eyes you shall write them on the do door posts of your house and on your gates so I visited a friend and then this friend was a roommate with a Jewish person so they had like a, the law part of it written on the door post it's written on the door post right so the law to them and, and like the Lord when he said in Matthew chapter 23 um, what the Pharisees did in verse 5 but all their works they do to be seen by men they make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments you know the phylacteries what they are you put some yeah, like part of the law inside what we call the phylactery made out of um, Oh, but it's made from the animals. They are the nerves, right? And then they put it here and they put it on their hands. This is literally. They, they, they do this literally. What exactly? So all they, when, now they are pious when they do that. Okay. Put it on the door post, on, the, on your hand, on your forehead. But here Christ came and he said, no, it's no longer outside. It is inside you. It's in your heart. So that you become the living Bible, the living gospel. Your life will become the living. So now, and then he said, but I'll give you the commandment and I will give you the Holy Spirit to be able to do it. Right? So if you have fellowship with the Holy Spirit, then you can do the commandment. If we have this fellowship, then we can die to the world and live for Christ. So they are connected somehow, but they are two different points. Good question, Yani. Your thinking and uh, makes sense that makes you wonder Yani, what's the difference, Yani? coming and blessing us um, in our meeting and giving us the, the terms and the recipe how to keep God's covenant and we ask him to pray for us that uh, this year be a prosperous and, uh, we're, and to live the life of renewal and always be new and uh, we're looking forward to seeing you again Sayyidina uh, hopefully when you visit the women's meeting downstairs. <laughs> um, every uh, Wednesday, uh, we have uh, St. Moses the Strong's meeting. We alternate with a lecture and Bible study. So um, we made an exception this week because Sayyid knows here, but today was supposed to be Bible study. And um, so God willing, next week will be Bible study. We're studying the book of Romans chapter 12. Um, and work this was like a Bible study Khalas <laughs> will keep next week uh, <laughs> it's a combination <laughs> um, so we, we hope to see you all I know this couple of new faces so uh, if you don't mind and if you like we uh, will take your number and your um, email we only send emails maybe once a week, so we're very light on emails. And uh, we'll, the servants will find you if you're the first time here. Um, after we're done, there's a quick bite in the back, and there's one table of ping pong, so uh, if anybody uh, looking for a challenge. Excuse me. Can you distribute these, please? If you haven't already got one of these yeah 
ink is running out. So you can start from the button. This is, um, I call this the uh, year end spiritual inventory. Okay? And this can be very useful for you, not only to check yourselves according to these items at the end of the year, but it can also help you every time you go for confession. Every time, every time you go for confession, this can help you check yourselves also in these areas of life. Because sometimes you say, what am I going to do or, or to say in, in my confessions? So it helps you in many areas in life, such as your prayer life, the reading of the Bible, your service, your love for the Lord in general, and other spiritual readings. And then it has a list of many kinds of sins. Summarized and I think seven one two three four five six seven Sins of the spirit sins of the thoughts sins of the se sins of the senses Sins by the tongue or the, by the word sins, sins of the emotions sins of intention and sins of action So it, it really helps you um, Whenever you are going to confess And also in the end of the year you, it can help you or guide your time alone when you want to check yourselves in these areas and items. And also I have a New Year calendar for you. It has the picture of Saint Mark the Apostle, picture of His Holiness Pope Shenouda, picture of His Holiness Pope Tawadros. So please come and take one and also the bookmarker here. Very good. Sally. Amen, amen, amen. In our death, O Lord, we proclaim your holy resurrection ascension into the heavens we confess we praise you we bless you we you, O Lord, and we entreat you, O our Dear Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this great opportunity to, stand, to allow us here to stand in front of you to remind us that you renewed your covenant with us, that this covenant was paid by and was turned by your holy blood. Help us, O Lord, to live this life of renewal and to live a new life every day of our life as we heard today. Help us, O oh Lord, to be renewed in our prayer, to renew in our repentance, to renew in hearing your words that will act as a light in our life, that will lead us into the right path, that will lead us into eternal life where we enjoy our eternity with you, O oh Lord. We ask you, Lord, to be with his holiness, Pope to Adros II, be with his grace, Amba David, be with the priest of the church, Abu and the Buddha, Abu and the Abu and Anthony, be with your people in Egypt, protect them, and raise the flag of the cross all over the world and the four corners of the, the earth. We ask you, Lord, those who are far away from you, bring them back to church 
and bring them back to find the light, the right path. And those who don't know your, and don't see the light, enlighten their eyes, may they see your light. Help us, O Lord, to proclaim your name and to be witness to you everywhere we go and in everything we do. Be with those who are in need, be those who ask us to remember them in our supplications and prayers, those who are sick and those who are mourning. Amen. Through the intercessions of the Theotokos, the Holy Blessed Virgin Saint Mary, and all the choir of the heavenly and all the saints, through the prayers of Saint George and Saint Shinul and the prayers of the saints of this day, may their holy blessings, their prayers, their blessing be with us all. Amen. And make us all worthy to pray thankfully and say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is. Give us this day our daily and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, for thine is the kingdom come. The love of God the Father and the grace of his only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. The gift and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Go in peace and may the peace of God be with you. If you, if you want to come and take the calendars, please go.